In the framework of renew, restoring essential needs, enhancing worship, the title of today's message is The Grace of Giving. We have the scriptures on the screen, but you may also want to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We read there, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, writes the apostle, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Grace giving. Now I have been living in these verses all week long. You are just now interacting with them for the first time in maybe a long time. To, so to succinctly summarize, the apostle is speaking about the grace of God that abounded in the riches of their liberality, that is, those believers in Macedonia, and we will unpack that in just a few moments. Grace again, the apostle repeats, complete this grace in you, this grace of giving. See that you abound in this grace, a third mention and you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the thread that weaves its way through these verses at the opening of 2 Corinthians chapter 8? Here's the main idea. Latch on to this. The grace of giving, our giving, arises from the grace of Christ's giving. The grace of giving, our giving, arises from the grace of Christ's giving. I would imagine that many here have been to the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina. I see some heads nodding. It is the number one tourist attraction in North Carolina, receiving approximately one million visitors every year. For over a decade, we lived about three miles by air, if we were a bird, and could have perched on one of the steeples. We lived about three miles from the Biltmore Estate about five and a half or six miles from the actual entrance. For those of you who have taken the tour and maybe had the audio tour, you know that there are 250 rooms, 35 bedrooms, 43 bathrooms, 65 fireplaces, 178,926 square feet. It is a masterpiece of architecture reflecting, I don't use this word a whole lot, the opulence and grandeur of the Gilded Age. I think we've been through the Biltmore State probably, I don't know, three or four times for the first uh, four or five years that we lived in Asheville. We got a season pass because anybody who came to visit us, they wanted to go to the Biltmore State, right? Once you've seen about five bedrooms, you've seen them all. <laughs> but 
the entryway. Now that is something magnificent. And the dining room, that is something really magnificent. But when you have a season pass, the best part of a season pass is that you can go and just enjoy the grounds all year long. And often we would do that. we just go on the grounds and take a walk, take our bicycles. It was beautiful. The Biltmore Estate is indeed an American icon. A few moments ago, you noticed that it reflected the opulence and grandeur of the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age was a term popularized by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner in their 1873 novel, The Gilded Age, a tale of today, satirizing the greed and political corruption of the era. The name Gilded Age suggests that the period was glittering on the surface, but corrupt underneath. Glittering on the surface, but corrupt underneath. In contrast to the suffering servant that we read about in Isaiah 53, who had no majesty or beauty that would attract us to him, but was beautiful on the inside. What a contrast! between all that the Biltmore Estate and what it symbolizes, opulence, and as I have referred to some, an exorbitant display of greed, <laughs> and the suffering servant prophesied by Isaiah chapter 53, who came in reality as Jesus for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, rich is used there in two different ways. And many, many years ago, when we went to the Biltmore Estate for the first time, and actually prior to that, we had been to the Hearst Castle in California, I told Lexi, our daughter, that the Biltmore Estate is something that Jesus started out with. But then he traded that for poverty, literal poverty. Jesus traded it for the poverty of probably a very rustic, crude, dwelling that we wouldn't even think about staying in overnight. Reflecting this contrast of, of richness and, and wealth, the apostle also writes in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And in various other English translations, made himself nothing, gave up his divine privilege, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross." Now, the apostle prefaces that with, let this mind be in you. And it's passages such as these, as well as others in the New Testament, that have been the foundation, the inspiration of so many songs. You may recognize this one. He left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha there to lay down his life for me. If that isn't love, then the ocean is dry. There are no stars in the sky and sparrows can't fly. If that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. If that isn't love. The grace of giving, our giving, arises from the grace of Christ's giving. 
Let's go back and take a closer look at those words, those sentences about the grace of giving from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We make known to you the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. See the sequence. The grace of God. There was a great trial of affliction involved, but yet there was mingled with that the abundance of joy out of the context of deep poverty. They abounded in the riches of their liberality. They gave out of their poverty. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift of the the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. See the sequence again. According to ability, beyond ability, freely willing, even imploring, joining in the fellowship, the participation of ministering to the saints. Now, what is this phrase, ministering to the saints? What is the context of what the apostle is talking about? We're actually in two New Testament letters here. We're in Corinthians, in which Corinth is the principal community in a region known as Achaia. But as the apostle is writing to the believers in Corinth, he's actually referring to another group in Philippi in the region of Macedonia and this ministering to the saints. Let's put the puzzle together, okay? We're going to put the puzzle together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we get some insight. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we read this. The apostle states there, again to the Corinthian believers, concerning the collection of the saints, on the first day of the week, each one of you should lay aside something and storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come, and when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. So there's some kind of a need. There's some kind of an outpouring of support to the Christian community in Jerusalem. Are you tracking with that? Thank you for that wink. So in the New Testament, we find a reference in Acts chapter 11 of a famine that is predicted by the prophet Abagus. You can find this in Acts chapter 11, verses 27 and following. And Bible scholars and historians point to this famine taking place sometime during the reign of Claudius Caesar, sometime between 41 and 54 AD. Now, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 26, we read of these two regions again, Macedonia and Achaia. The apostle now is writing to the believers in Rome, and he says, well, Macedonia and Achaia North Carolina, South Carolina, were pleased to make a contribution to the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. So what is going on? The Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were often marginalized within Jewish society because of their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Many of them were poor, and the famine exacerbated their struggles. Now, we don't know all of the details specifically about what was happening in Jerusalem, but as Bible scholars and historians put all this together, there was an outpouring of support to the believers in Jerusalem. The contributions were a powerful symbol of unity between Jewish and Gentile Christians. By contributing to the needs of the Jerusalem church, Gentile believers demonstrated their gratitude and connection to the Jewish roots of their faith. So this is the biblical context. This is the historical context of these phrases that we read, ministering to the saints, collection for the saints. Now let's look at just a little bit more at the context of both Philippi and Corinth, of both Macedonia and Achaia. In Acts chapter 16, we have the record of Paul's ministry in Philippi. He was preaching, he was imprisoned, He, along with Silas, were beaten. Their feet were placed in stocks. They begin to have a praise service in prison. An earthquake happens. And the jailer is about ready to take his life. And Paul calls out, no, no, don't do that. We're all here. None of the prisoners are leaving. Do you grasp the significance, the impact, the influence that Paul and Silas' praise service had on those prisoners? None of them left. 
They stayed put. No wonder the jailer asked the question, what must I do to be saved? What kind of people are you anyway? Huge, huge experience there that affected not only the jailer, affected not only those other prisoners, but the entire believing community in Philippi. Now, that's a very concise snapshot of Philippi. Let's go on to Corinth. We read this in Acts chapter 18. Many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized, and one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack you and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Interesting that God gives a specific verbalized message to Paul about his experience in Corinth. Paul, don't worry. No one here is going to harm you. I have a lot of people in this city. Now, why would Paul be anxious about this? Again, as you read the book of Acts, I'm just going to hit some bullet points. Well, in chapter 14, he was stoned at Lystra. In Philippi, as we have already noted, he was beaten and thrown into prison. In chapter 17, in Thessalonica, Paul is spared, but Jason is grabbed by a mob and taken out of his house. Oh, I wish I lived in Bible times and could have been a prophet or an apostle. No, you don't. <laughs> it was a risky life. So this, is, again, is the context of Paul's message to the Corinthians about ministering to the saints and the collection for the saints. Now, you can already start to make the application. Our giving arises out of the grace of Christ that has been given to us. Are you tracking with that? You got that? Come on, I want to keep preaching, so give me a head nod. Okay, thank you. Now, here's the next element for us to consider. Are we sweet or are we sour? Pastor, where are you going with this? Are we sweet or are we sour? You don't pick this up unless you read the New Testament letters at least five or eight times. It's not on the surface. It's underneath. The church at Philippi was Paul's sweet church, sweet community there. Just a couple of sound bites from Philippians, chapter 1, verse 8. He writes, how greatly I long for you with all the affection of Jesus Christ. Opening comments, chapter 1 of Philippians. Corinth, now I plead with you that there are no divisions among you. Are you beginning to feel the contrast already? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, he testifies, No church shared with me, but you only. That's Philippians 4, 15. You can quote Philippians 4, 13. Isn't it? I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. 15? Two verses after 13, right? 19, 419, Philippians. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Philippi, sweet church. Now, they had some issues going on there. There were a couple of ladies there named Yodia and Suntike. And Paul calls them out in his letter. Help these two women to get along. Little did they know that their names will be recorded for hundreds of years 
Had they known that, I think they probably would have solved this before Paul wrote about it. So in heaven, we can say, oh, hey, Yudia, did you guys ever get that worked out? I guess you did. <laughs> in Corinth, there were what I call apostle fan clubs. I'm of Apollos. Apollos is my man. He's my YouTube preacher. No, 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 no. I am Cephas. I, I, I'm in the Peter club. Oh, no, no. Well, I'm of Paul. Well, I, I'm just going to one-up you all. I'm not for Apollos. I'm not for Peter. I, I, I'm not for Paul. I'm for Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surpass all of you. So there were apostle fan clubs, there were lawsuits, there was open immorality being tolerated. Uh, Corinth was the sour church, eh, on the edge of being sour. To the point that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 21, the apostle Paul writes to the believers in Corinth, Shall I come to you with a rod or with gentleness? And then again, in his second letter, notice the contrast on the screen, sweet and sour. In his second letter, Paul quotes back what he has heard from the community in Corinth. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. For some, people just did not like Paul at all. Just didn't resonate with him. Hmm. So one more quote from his letter to the Corinthian believers <clears throat> in his second letter, chapter 13. I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given to me for edification. Again, you don't really begin to absorb this until you read these letters at least five times and you begin to feel the human element that is in play. So, Paul is writing to the believers in Corinth holding up the believers in Macedonia as an example of grace giving, the grace that was bestowed upon them through great trial of affliction, affliction in the abundance of their joy, out of their deep poverty, they responded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, and yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Reminds me of, and probably you as well, reminds us of an experience and a comment that Jesus had one day in the temple shortly before his passion. Mark chapter 12, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins with only a few, worth only a few cents. Truly, I tell you, Jesus went on to say, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others, not just individually, but cumulatively, all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. Are you challenged yet? Where are we as we think about giving ourselves to the Lord? Where are we as we think about glorifying Him? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though He was rich, yet for your sakes became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. Here are the bullet takeaways. Grace, graceful giving, the grace of giving arises from the grace we have received from Christ. 
It arises from giving ourselves to the Lord. It arises from giving ourselves to the fellowship. It arises from a free willingness. And it arises from our ability and maybe even beyond our perceived ability. Okay, Thomas. You and I had a conversation before the worship service started. And you said, I'm really looking forward to your message today, Pastor. And I said, you better hold that thought until you hear it. <laughs> Reaching back to last week, the God of the Edge creates scenarios leading to extraordinary experience of living life on the edge, resulting in woohoo! What a ride! Now and eternally. And we looked at the experience of Abraham and Moses and Daniel, and we asked ourselves the question, does God himself live on the edge? Yes, God himself lives on the edge for us. So how does that impact us here at 920 North Sharon Amity Road, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28211? As you heard earlier, we are looking at a project that really leans more into, prospectively, four million dollars. That is on the edge for us as a community. And reaching back to last week, the reason this is on the edge for us is because arising out of our inner being, we are challenged with fear. I don't know how God is going to provide if I do X. Or it arises out of, I just want my wants. I want my wants here and now. Fear, and I want my wants. So we all have to process that. We have to come to some type of a place where we say, change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. But in the process, are we sweet or are we sour? Sweet or sour? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we read one more soundbite from the apostle now i plead with you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that you speak all the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment for it has been declared to me concerning you my brethren that those of chloe's household that there are contentions among you now i don't i don't know anybody named chloe in this congregation so chloe's not been you know filling my ear but I have picked up indirectly that there is an attitude of sourness among some. And specifically, you know, we had a run at this 20 to 25 years ago. Specifically in recent weeks, I am weary about hearing renew. Specifically, I don't agree with this or that approach. And just kind of a general attitude of criticism among some. Now, I have not actually encountered that personally, but again, through Chloe, whoever Chloe is, it's come back to me. I remind you of this observation from Proverbs chapter 18. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. That goes both ways, doesn't it? It goes both ways. Our words can lead to life, or our words can lead to 
figuratively death. I think many of you are familiar with this quote that comes from Teddy Roosevelt. And maybe not all of it applies to our immediate situation, but the theme of it does, the tenor of it does. So from Teddy Roosevelt, it is not the critic who counts nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But he who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spins himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Now, I don't know for sure, but it's my hunch that the little rivulets, the little currents of negativity are probably arising from those who are not involved. There are volunteers who are pouring in tens of hours into this ministry. And so... <clears throat> This is a Jesus get in the boat moment. It's a Jesus get in the boat moment. John chapter 6, Jesus performs the miracle of feeding the 5,000, which was probably 15 to 20,000. And there's a groundswell that arises from the masses. Jesus, Jesus. 31, Jesus, Jesus, 31. I'm speaking about A.D. 31. There are people in the crowd that have red hats, and on them is M-L-G-A. You don't know what that means, do you? M-L-G-A. Make Israel great again. And Jesus catches this and he shuts it down. Peter, Matthew, Andrew, Thomas, in the boat now. You're going to the other side. This is a get in the boat moment. And it's a double meaning. Get in the boat and take your negativity and your criticism off the property. And it's a get in the boat moment to get in the boat with Jesus. So that we can be a part of an experience in which we say, Woohoo! <laughs> what a ride. The Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, I write these things being absent according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. So I'm going to borrow those words. Pastor Brian, I say these things according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. Are you wrestling with fear? Are you wrestling with, I want my wants? Are you wrestling with sourness? Well, the God of the edge invites us to extraordinary experiences, living life on the edge, resulting in, wow, what a ride. The grace of giving arises from the grace that we have received in Christ, arises from giving ourselves to the Lord 
arises from giving ourselves to each other, arises from a free willingness, arises from our ability and maybe even beyond our ability to open your heart to the grace of giving that God wants to do in each one of us.